This is The Gem on the Queen's Crown, a podcast talking about Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio sports. Here's the host, Lee W. Mowen. Welcome to the 15th episode of this podcast talking Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio sports. Very excited to bring you this episode. One, because soon Jim DeBelt will join me here on the podcast to talk about the start of basketball season. In the state of Ohio, girls basketball season started last weekend. A lot of tournaments happening around the Miami Valley and the Sunday area. And boys basketball starting up this weekend. College hoops, well, they have begun already. And Jim is quite the mastermind of hoops here in the Southwest Ohio Quadrant. It'll be nice to have Jim back on for the first time since episode number four. But first, a couple things to get out of the way. You can listen to the Gem on the Queen's Crown on the host website, gemcitysports.com, on my website, theleewmallon.com, and also on iTunes or your favorite podcast app, which gets the iTunes feed right to it. Didn't realize how many apps already had the Gem on the Queen's Crown feed on it. That's quite cool. Also available on Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, and also iHeartRadio. Just got the confirmation email today as I looked into my spam folder and found that it was actually delivered last night. So go ahead, if you already have the iHeartRadio app, find the Gem on the Queen's Crown and you can listen to all 15 episodes that way. It's just another platform where you can listen to the podcast talking about Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio sports. Last week, I had a great episode with Chad Hollingsworth. If you haven't listened to it, it is quite important to you if you like soccer in the Sunday area. But I forgot to mention last week's football playoff scores, as I have been the past few episodes. So I do apologize about that, and I like to go ahead and get to Week 13 scores. Trotwood Madison handled Shabanaugh Julian 44-14. Clinton Massey defeated Cincinnati Wyoming 28-7. Marion Local shut out Coldwater 33-0. Middletown Madison handled West Jefferson a 42-7 loss. Winton Woods defeated LaSalle in a very classic game. 16-14 Warriors over the Lancers of LaSalle. Minster defeated Delpho St. John's shutout style 20-0. And Colerain handed St. Xavier a 21-14 loss. In Week 13... The Sunday area went 7-5, seven and five, seven wins against five losses, setting up Week 14. Witten Woods handled Massillon, Washington, 56-21. Trotwood Madison defeated Toledo Central Catholic, 16-7. Pickerington Central got the 42-28 win against Colerain. Minster won 40-7 against Norwalk St. Paul. Clinton Massey defeated New Concord's John Glenn, 28-21. Marion Local, 31. Finley, Liberty Benton, 13. And Wheelersburg, 15. Middletown Masson, 10. So in week 14, Sunday schools went 5-2. and two, And that means it sets up one last game for five local squads in the Sunday area. It's time for the state championship schedule at Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in Canton, Ohio. And here's who's playing for which division. First off for Division 2, Winton Woods, representing the Cincinnati area, will take on Akron's Archbishop Hogan. In Division 3, it will be Trotwood Madison, representing Dayton, battling against Dresden Tri-Valley. In Division 4, Clinton Massey, out of Clinton County, near the Wilmington, Ohio area. The Falcons will take on Steubenville for the D4 title. In D6, it's Marion Local versus Kirkland. And in Division 7, Minster will take on Cuyahoga Heights. And that's your five teams preparing for a state championship battle. The winner takes home the state title. So congratulations to those five schools representing the Sinday area. As they're about ready to play for the championships. So now we're joined with Jim DeBelt. Jim, how you doing? Doing great. It's basketball season. You know, things couldn't be any better for me. You've been in the writing business for a long, long time. 
What's your initial take to the start of this 2017-2018 girls basketball season? Well, Lee, I really think this year is going to be another special year. Uh, there's a lot of great players in the Dayton area. There's a lot of great younger players that are going to make a name for themselves as well this year. So I look for, you know, the, the, the teams to be really strong. There's a lot of really strong teams in the area. And there are several who I think could make a nice tournament run, including possibly getting to the state tournament this year. Let's talk about your last broadcast on the Gem City Sports Network, the DeBelt Report Top 50. How did that go? It went really well. Um, you know, we had uh, 40 of the 50 kids were on. I think it was 40 of the 50 kids were there. And then you'll have to excuse me. I'm fighting a really bad cold. This weather is destroying me right now. So you have to bear with me on that part. But understand um, that. The, the top 50 banquet, it went really well. Uh, we had several, several great kids there. Um, almost 80% of the kids that were ranked in the top 50 were in attendance. And, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to start the season um, the right way and bring everybody together one last time before they go at each other on the court. And recently on Twitter, you released some of the rankings, and if people would like to follow you on Twitter, that's jdabs86, J-D-A-B-B-S-8-6 on Twitter. Tell me some of these rankings you just released. Yeah, what I did was each each day, and I started the day after the banquet, but each day I will release three of the top 50 kids. So once in the morning, once in the afternoon, once in the evening, I will release a little profile for college coaches and fans to read about each of the kids. It'll have their picture. We took pictures the day of the banquet, and it gives them an opportunity just to get a little bit of extra publicity, especially for the kids that aren't signed yet, so the college coaches kind of get to know a little bit about the kid a little bit better and maybe come out here and take a look at them for a possible chance to play with them in the future. Like we mentioned, the girls' basketball season is just underway, started last weekend. Did you catch any of the opening weekend games, Jim? I did, actually. I was at um, our Canham's tournament on Friday night to watch Northwestern, uh, Brookville, our Canham, and Franklin Monroe. And then Saturday night, I went back over to, tri to Dark County, to Tri-Village, to watch Tri-Village for sales in the finals of their tournament, and then Miami Valley School and Greenan in the consolation game. And then um, was out this week as well. So, uh, yeah, it's an exciting, you know, exciting opening weekend, and the college season is well underway, and now the high school season is going. So, you know, it should be a really fun year for basketball fans here in the Dayton area, for sure. We'll touch up on the college season a little bit later, but Franklin Monroe ended up winning the first ever Arcanum tournament, as Arcanum was part of the Tri Village tournament years ago. That adds a little fuel to the fire for that Arcanum and Franklin Monroe battle, Southern Dark County. Yeah, that's it's always a big rivalry. Actually, I used to live over there in Pittsburgh for about five years back in the nineties, so I know the communities are very supportive of each other but they're also rivals you know they both want to beat the other team but like they both had unfortunate situations take place with students and they've come together that communities come together to help support each other during the time of the, of the tragic times but when that like when sports seasons here when they're on the court and you know, they want to beat each other but like i said they're very supportive of each other as well i've actually got to see the boys' basketball battle between Arcanum and Franklin Monroe last year. Man, at Arcanum, that place was packed. That was a great turnout and a great game. Franklin Monroe ended up pulling out that victory late last season. You know, it's a, the, both schools are new, and relatively new, within, ten, within five years, I would say. And uh, both gyms are much, much better than their old one, although the old one had a lot of memories for me because I was at Franklin Monroe and Arcanum quite a bit back when I was, like I said, when I first got started back in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, both of the fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Last weekend, I went to a boys' scrimmage at Franklin Monroe with uh, Tecumseh and um, another team out of Columbus, and they had both gyms open. So I moseyed on over to the what I call the old gym. Uh, which is where the high school team used to play. Now it's the middle school gym because they have a brand new school. And just walking in there, it's amazing the memories that come back. When you walk into a place you haven't been in for a long time, 
it's amazing how many great memories just come flooding back through your head just from the times that I've been in that gym. You know, Franklin Monroe is an outstanding basketball community, so is Arcanum. The CCC, you know, they're all, most of them, I think they're all actually small town, uh, small community basketball. Mm-hmm. They're all smaller schools, so it's all, you know, it's not like 5,000 students to deal with. They're all small country type of environment. And that's really exciting for me because that's, that's my favorite kind of basketball is you drive out to Arcanum or Tri-Village or Bradford, uh, for me, I always like to stop at the mom and pop's place for, for dinner, you know, patronize in the community. And then, you know, just watching small school basketball for me is really exciting because it really, the community comes together and then they, uh, and they, you know, they, they build their Saturday nights about, go, about, about going to watch their team play, which I think is, a, is an advantage when you're a smaller school like that. I think the biggest town in the Cross County Conference would be, what, Covington? And it's not like big, super huge like Dayton. It's a small town on its own, but they had a couple big shops. They had a Kmart at one point. At least I think that's I would, Covington. Yeah, I would say Covington probably, just off the top of my head, is, is pretty large for that for the CCC. Arcanum's a nice sized town. They got a few things in there as well, but there's a lot of small towns: New Madison, Tri Village, Pittsburgh, Franklin Monroe, Pleasant Hill, Newton. Twin Valley South, Tri County North. Those, those are all from pretty small villages or small small towns. And I'm from and West for me, Alexandria, like I said, so. that that and, and you know that area over there very well. So mm-hmm. for me, it's exciting to be able to see, like I said, the communities come together like that and just yes. support their kids. Yes, it is. I mean, like I mentioned, I'm from West Alex. I went to Valley View. Two small towns combined together in a school district. And I currently work for two big schools for their hockey teams broadcasting. So I've seen both sides of the coin. And yes, yes, I totally agree on that. Can I mention the game that I did yesterday? Going to the small village of Ansonia. I got to see the Tigers girls basketball open up their season. They took on... Burn Indiana's South Adams Starfires, which is probably one of the coolest names I've ever got to say live on a broadcast. It turned out to be a 70-34 to win for South Adams, Indiana. They pulled away lots of takeaways for that Starfires defense against Ansonia. And I got to see one of the South Adams players, Lexi Dellinger. She broke the 1,000 points barrier. With 17 points last night, the official nice. score. You know, and, and that's always a big accomplishment. I love it when kids break those kind of those 1,000 point marks. They're so huge, and uh, you know, everybody makes a big deal about it. And they should make a big deal about it. It's, it's a great accomplishment. But um, you know, I, I noticed you went over. You saw Jim Boland's squad over at Ansonia, and and that's another school in the CCC that um, you know, I've been there a couple times, actually. Uh, ironically, first the only, first and only job I ever applied for when I was living over there is I applied for the Ansonia job, girls' job. And after I um, come to realize with my work schedule and stuff, now I was not in the final two, um, but I was you know one of the one of the early applicants and I had to withdraw after that. But it's um, you know like I said, the community's great over there and. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you got a chance to experience that kind of atmosphere. Absolutely. It was great. And from what I understood, Burn, Indiana is a small town, too, 30 miles south of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they traveled one hour, 10 minutes, or 48 miles to get to Ansonia just to play the game. And I got to see two good teams battle it out. Ansonia, they might not have the height that they like, but... They're really quick. They're really athletic. Although some of the times, some of that quick up-tempo costs them a couple turnovers. As you see, long passes go down towards the hallway on that side. But Ansonia mm-hmm. should have a good 2017-2018 year. Yeah, they, they, are, they are, like I said, a young team. They've got a couple of nice kids that, you know, do have some experience. And like you said, um, you know, as the season goes on, I look for them to get better as the season goes on, and especially in the CCC, you know, I look for Miami East, Franklin Monroe, Tri-Village will probably be, and Covington will probably be the f- four teams that I think have the best chance. Uh, Newton has a great point guard, Tatum McBride, who in that conference alone with her, you know, by herself is going to 
lift up the uh, talent level of Newton High School this year um, to to compete. Um, but you know, as far as like challenging for the league title, I think it's you know you mentioned that earlier at Miami East, Franklin Monroe, Tri Village, and Covington um, will probably be the early favorites. Um, you know, Bradford's got a great freshman, Skip Miller. Um, is is going to develop into a nice player for Bradford over there. Uh, you know, Arcanum, like we mentioned, has a couple of good young kids, Kalo, Daniel, Gracie Garno, um, and got to see them play over the weekend. So there are some really good individual players as well as three or four really talented teams in that league. Just to recap the top scores for Ansonia last night, Stadman and Henderson with nine points apiece for the Tigers. And Dellinger for South Adams finished with 17 to lead all. Didn't score a single point in that second half. And if I remember right, didn't play much after the half as well. But I just mm-hmm. remember the initial thought, because I didn't know that that last basket was so huge until their official score told me, hey, that's a 1,000 points for her. It also helped that she was uh, the daughter of the official scorer as well. So that was that was really cool to see. And I knew it was a big basket just because South Adams folks were cheering very loudly for that basket. That, and I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> No doubt. No doubt. I don't know if I ever broadcasted a thousand-point basket like that. I'm trying to think. I've done a lot of games. But... I've seen several in person. I've seen a couple 2,000-point scores as well. But it's always a lot of pressure because they know and they know what they need going into the game. Sometimes I see kids press too much to where they're throwing some ugly shots up early. And it's almost like just settle down. Your shots are going to come. Your points are going to come. I know you're nervous about 1,000 points, you're 10 away or whatever. And I remember a couple years ago a girl was 13 points from 1,000 in tournament. Mm -hmm. And... She or maybe ten points away or something like that, and she didn't get it the first tournament game. She missed a ton of shots, and but they won. You know, it's one of those things where if they lose that game, then she won't get. She's done. Right. And came back the next game and scored her thousandth point in the last minute and a half of a loss. Hmm. So they were a minute and a half away from getting eliminated, and she scored her thousandth point in the last minute and a half. Talk about cutting it close. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. And it's it's, it's like, sometimes a kid, sometimes the kids just think too much. Just go out and play. It's it's always some of that weighs down on the mind, though. That's a big accomplishment. It's like yeah. Jose Siri for the Dragons this summer. He broke the Midwest League record for consecutive games with a hit, thirty nine, and that was the last that bat for him at Fort Wayne. So that could have I been remember snapped in Indiana. Yeah, I remember seeing that. That was huge. Yeah, I'm, that's it still, was huge. That was still giving me goosebumps. And now series part of the 40-man <laughs> roster for Cincinnati. So that's that's big, too. So right. happy for him. Right, definitely. Jim, what are some of the games you recommend people listening to this podcast? What are some of the games you recommend them checking out? Well, instead of going with games, because I don't have them all memorized, I think there are some teams that we can talk about if you'd like. Maybe some okay. teams to get to go see. That works. That's going to be a lot easier for me. Well, ironically, and I don't know exactly when this is going to air, but for this Saturday is a huge game at Tip City between my number one preseason Division Two team of Tippecanoe against my number one Division One team in Fairmont. Um, they're they're going head to head right off the bat. You know, first second weekend of the season, first full week. Tip and Fairmont play at one o'clock this Saturday, December the second. At tip, mm-hmm. so it's going to be a great way to watch that game before the big Ohio State Wisconsin game Saturday night. Um, an opportunity to be able to see some great players: uh, Madeline Westbelt, sophomore; Mad- Madison Bartley, sophomore; Molly Morgan Elliott Jr. at Fairmont. All three six one or taller. Uh, tip City's got Maddie Frederick, the girl that moved in from Arizona. She's going to Iowa State and. Top 75 player in America. Uh, they've got four returning starters from a regional finalist team last year that lost to Alter, including Allison Mater, who's going to Cedarville. So that that game's not going to make or break it. either team. 
but it's going to go a long way to see how good they are right now and how much they've got to work on and what they have to work on, I should say, advanced throughout the season. But that, that's a big game. But Division One wise you look at teams like Fairmont, Springboro, a team that's got Jordan Deal back. Beaver Creek's got three or four really good players back. Centerville's got some, some good young kids coming in. You know, those teams are all going to be pretty talented as far as Division One is concerned. As they, as they like to say, the big school division, right? I do think that, you know, I, I, I look for those teams to really be competitive and to challenge. Uh, Wayne High School is a team that has, <clears throat> they lost a couple kids who transferred and a couple kids who are injured. But they're still really loaded with some college potential players. Tecumseh is another Division One school. They've got a really good backcourt of Presley Griffiths, who's a junior that's already committed to Bowling Green. And Corinne Thomas, another junior, who will go somewhere, but she's not decided yet. She's a junior as well. So Division One looks pretty strong. Northmont is another team. There's a sleeper team. They they took it to Butler earlier this week. But Northmont's a team that I think could open some eyes as well in Division One. What games are you going to broadcast for the Gem City Sports Network? That is undetermined yet. I don't know for sure kind of where that's going to go. I haven't really thought too much about it until I get everything lined up at my end on that. But I, <clears throat> there's, I mean, unfortunately, I'd love to do the Tip Fairmont game Saturday, but unfortunately, I don't have the right equipment for that yet. Plus, the fact that my, my voice may be gone by Saturday. It started disappearing this morning, so <clears throat> I don't even know if I'd even be able to do a Saturday, but it's going to be a great game to see on Saturday. But that that would be obviously a, a great game to do. But there's there's so many great teams and so many good games to be able to broadcast. Um, and I know you you did your game last night, and hopefully you'll uh, get to hear you do some more throughout the season. But you know, girls basketball in Dayton is is as good as it's ever been, and it's going to get even better with these young studs that are coming through. Girl from Springfield, Michaela Purdue, a freshman Monday night in her first high school game as a freshman, dropped 40 points against Yellow Springs. That's that's crazy to think about, your first high school game dropping. That's a lot of points. That, that's a lot of baskets. Um, that, uh, yeah, that's a lot. I and mean, she shot the ball really, really well. She played really well. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, look at the competition. Well, first of all, Springfield is a team that's really struggled lately. So anything that they do positively is great for the program. Secondly, I always tell people, I don't care who we play or who who you play. When you score 50, the ball's still got to go in the basket. Yeah, that's still an accomplishment, no matter you who still you got, play. You, this, the ball's still got to go in the basket, unless you shoot 50 times, and that's not impressive to me. But I think she was something like 14 for 21 or something. That's that's amazing percentage. That's great. That's you know? 66%. But, yeah, so Division One. If you'd like, I can talk about a couple of the other divisions as well. But, um, you know, Division One's going to be full of exciting big school basketball this year. You said that you didn't know what your broadcasting schedule is going to be like for GCSN. But what are some of the games that you have kind of off the top of the head, your wish list for broadcasting games on GCSN? Well, I would love to do a Minster game. Um, Minster is going to be really fun to watch this year, and it's a great. It's I was up there for a scrimmage a couple weeks ago, and thought, man, this would be a really nice venue to do a game. Minster doesn't get a lot of radio radio ink as far as down in this area, mm-hmm. but I think that doing a Minster like the Minster for Sales game would be huge, or Minster Lorenby game, or, or something like that would be would be huge. I know there's obviously other stations that broadcast those schools up there, but. Um, you know, who's to say that two of us couldn't do it? You know, so, you know, I'm I'm someone that's like, hey, you know, if it's a great game, it doesn't have to be solely broadcast by one 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 station. I mean, you know, in football they don't do that. You know, sometimes you have two or three different high school high school game would have two or three different stations doing the game. Now that's it's not all the time, but you know that that's not uncommon. But Minster, I'd love to do a game at Minster. I'd love to do a game at my alma mater of Tip. You know, tip, a tip out Lormy on a Monday night in a couple weeks would be big. Yes. Um, that would be a nice game to do. You know, I'd love to obviously do some games like I would love to do Alter won the state championship last year. would love to do maybe an Alter CJ game. That would be pretty big. CJ is going to be a lot better. Carol Alter. Carol's 
young, but they're going to get better every night. To do something like that, do some do like a Wayne Fairmont game, that would be big. Or a Tecumseh Kenton Ridge game would be a, always a big rivalry game. So something like that would be great. One, one another game I'd love to do is Franklin Monroe. We already talked about it. Franklin Monroe versus Tribe Village. Would love to do that game. Um, that would be, like I said, uh, kind of my old stomping grounds at FM. And you know, but what I've I've learned is with the Gem City Sports Network is obviously to do it live you have to have a really good internet signal at the school. Right. Some schools are much better than others. Mm-hmm. Some schools are more cooperative than others. Um, most of them are good about it. Most of them are good about it. But sometimes it's sometimes it's difficult to get everything you need to be able to do a game from a school. Some schools just don't have I mean some of the schools don't even have the capabilities of doing like internet, believe it or not, and as far as for us to be able to get on to do it. Because I always check internet when I'm at schools, wherever I'm at, I always check this just for future reference to see, um, you know, what would be a good place to do a game. Fort Recovery, love to do a game out there. That's that's a little bit far, but it, it still would be a, a, a good venue to do something as well. When I was broadcasting with GCS and most of the schools that I did, uh, very accommodating. Eaton, mm-hmm. that was always the place that I had the best luck to stream the games. I mean, got a okay. seat right down press row. It was it was awesome. It was awesome doing games at Eaton. Uh, Twin Valley South was cool. Uh, got the internet up and always did the Twin Valley South tip-off tournament. And this year, it's boys basketball, but this year, the tournament lineup is South, Dixie, Eaton, and National Trail. So that's a whole swing of 35, and mm-hmm. three of the four are in Preble County. The other one, it feels like you're still in Preble County. I mean, if you go right. north, south, New Lebanon, you blink and you miss it. But if you go on 35, you see the entire village. But that's a good setup. So I always like south. I always like uh, Tri-County North, too. That's a nice setup. You sit up on the second level. Kind of like a broadcasting closet, but once you get up, you're in the corner, and you see everything. That was always one of my favorite spots, too. North, South, Eaton. Trail was cool. Never got to broadcast a game at Preble Shawnee, though. But just the games that I've done, those are some of my favorite spots, because they were always close to home and rarely had a problem. And, of course, there's always a time that maybe your computer doesn't want to work. I've had that happen, and... Well, something else, too, to think about is I'm really big on where are we going to be broadcasting from. I don't like to be broadcasting from press or from the scores table. There's too much, it's too busy around there with players coming in and out and coaches right next to you. And that's just me. I would rather assume, like Tip City, for example, you could go up onto this, up into what, what they call the loft and broadcast from up in the loft, and there's nobody in your way. Nobody walks in front of you because you're up on, you know, you're looking down over the court at tip. Um, you know, Tecumseh, if you can use the coach's office, would be good. Um, I'm just not somebody who likes to broadcast or would like to broadcast from midcourt at the score table. Now, if they, have a, if they have a press row on the opposite side, then that's clearly, that's an ideal place. Yeah. But... To broadcast at the scores table to me is it's too busy and that's not probably my favorite thing to do. I'm not sure about you, but that's kind of my thoughts on that. I don't mind it. I mean, I've done a lot of games from a lot of different angles. At Wright State, I was kind of facing the end of the court type of thing. Uh, last night for WTGR, I was set up next to the press row, so I was right next to South Adams bench, and I don't mind it. I mean, the coach didn't get in my way and didn't really have any problems with sight although I did Good. Good. late in the fourth quarter uh, and Sonia was driving the ball and I think they turned it over and Sonia picked it up <laughs> however <laughs> it almost came right in front of my table I was like oh no <laughs> I'm going to be responsible for all the station equipment that I brought yep pretty but, that's it <laughs> but it, it was it was alright I don't mind as long as I have what I need I don't care where I broadcast. Just as long mm-hmm. as, you know, I can see most everything, I'm good to go. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not picky. I just want to broadcast, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So, 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, and Sonya's setup was really cool. So I was happy about that. You have to keep everybody informed, especially on Twitter, what games you're doing, so we can keep a listen. You know, I, I don't do many broadcasts. I just I can't do it much anymore. The game's getting a little bit faster, man. I'm not as young as you are, Lee. Come on now. You know, I'm 50. I'll be 50 next month. Actually, Big 5-0. I'm turning 30 in June. Don't remind me. Actually, I don't have many opportunities uh, with WTGR just because all my weekends are booked up with high school hockey. The five games I'm doing, I'll I'll let everyone know on Twitter, which, by the way, if you want to follow, it's the Lee W. Mallon. And if you want to follow Jim, it's J Dabs with two Bs, eight six on Twitter. So what's your next game? Ah, uh, for the for the Tiger. For Tiger Country ninety seven point five FM. Well, it's going to be Correct. next month in December. It's the nineteenth, and I'm at Missinawa Valley. I'm excited. I'm I'm happy to be part of radio station, actually being on air on FM waves again. Right. I, I miss that feeling. Before last year, I had two football games on 980 WNE, and I got to go to Fairmont, call that classic game against Miamisburg. Firebirds won it by one point. And then I went to Xenia, where Beaver Creek won. I forget what the score was, but that was the last game I did for ONE. I never got the demos of that. That Fairmont-Miamisburg game, I thought I did a pretty nice job. Now, the Xenia game, I thought it was a little rough, but... That's hearsay now. The demos are probably already destroyed. There's a couple of Dark County times. I'll be making the trip to Dark County a couple times for in December for games. So I'll have to touch base with you maybe and see about getting together and do so, doing a game or something maybe on GCSN or something. Cool. That works out if, if everybody's schedule works out because it's, you know, like I said, it would be fun just to sit and even just do the color. Yeah. I can keep up with that speed, <laughs> you know, let the experts do the play-by-play, but you know it would be it'd be exciting to do something like that with you once. Actually, I was thinking about this yesterday, watching the South Adams and Ansonia JV game. I got there early enough to watch both games. I'm just seeing the pace of the Starfires and the Tigers. I'm like, I broadcast hockey. That's what I do winter season, and this game is going too fast. I look down and right. it's like, oh, here they go again. Like, slow down. Yeah. It's just, yeah. is the pace of the game going quicker, or am I just losing my basketball touch? I think, I think depending on what game you're at, I think the pace can definitely be very high up tempo, um, especially if you have two really good teams that like to push it, that don't turn it over a lot. Um, you know, then there's some teams that think they're going to push it and they turn it over all the time, you know, because they want to play fast but they can't play fast. But I think, like I said, if you have two really good teams that like to push it and go and score gets the scores in the 60s, you know, 68-65 type of game then or higher, then, yeah, it's it's exciting because, like you said, it can, it, it can it, they can get and go sometimes. So they're very athletic. The girls are, uh, I think the girls are more, they have more opportunities to get better now than they did back 20 years ago with all the training and stuff going on. So they're going to be in they're better condition, better shape, just better basketball. So I'm not surprised at all that you thought the game was quick because I think it gets quick sometimes too to sit there and try to keep up with everything. I'm not. I'm not complaining on that. I'm not trying to. Make no, me think either. That I'm no, no way. I would much effort, rather trust like... me. I'd, I'd much rather watch a 70 to 65 game than a 30 to 25 game. I don't mind either. I mean, it's part of the story. I I'll broadcast anything. That's now, if you have two, if you have two really good teams and the defense is on top of it, and let's say Fairmont Tip is thirty to twenty-five, it probably won't be, but let's say it is. I mean, that's a good game. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm. You I'm know, but fine I'm someone that. who I love. I love scoring. I love to see the point. That's just kind of what my big nature is as far as that. Talking with Jim DeBelt, you can visit his website jimdebelt.com for the Dab Belt Report. It's got loads of information about Ohio girls basketball action and now we swing from the high school level to the college level college basketball season's been active for a while and jim i have all the records thus far of every single college in the Sinde area and i'll tell you that with all these colleges combined their record is 77 and 66 overall there's a lot of great records 
And Jim, if you don't mind me reading them all, I'll tell you what all the schools are doing so far. Sure. For Wright State, it's a 4-2 and two record. Dayton's 5-2 and two with both of the Flyers' losses <laughs> on the road. Miami's three and three. Cincinnati's four and three. Xavier is three and one. Northern Kentucky is one and four. That's your D1 look around the Cinde area. Central State is five and two. Cedarville four and one. Both those schools lying on U.S. Route 42. Urbana two and one. And in the D3 level of NCAA's, Wilmington three and one. Wittenberg two and three. Mount St. Joseph's three and two. Earlham zero oh and four. And Thomas Moore four and one. We look at the NAIA, just one, actually two schools in the Sunday area. Wilberforce is 4-4. Four and four. I believe they're still led by former Wright State Raider Aisha Gray. And Cincinnati Christian 0-7. We look at the community colleges. Edison off to a tremendous 7-0 and start. Sinclair at 5-2 and two, and Clark State 1-5. and five. And for the branch campuses, Miami Middletown 5-4 and four, with two wins in the Ohio Regional Campus Conference, Miami Hamilton one and two, Wright State Lake Campus one and seven, UC Claremont three and three, and Indiana University East in Richmond, a nice seven and two record. That's all the colleges around this area, and like I mentioned, some of them have really pristine records. Yeah, I got to see a few of those play. I saw IU East play uh, early in the season, got to see Edison State play Clark State. And I'm going to hopefully go to Miami this weekend for Dayton Day at Miami University. They're having a coach, Megan Duffy, as a former player at CJ. And head assistant coach, Frank Goldsberry, was actually her coach at CJ when she played there. And he also coached at Tip City and Northmont. They're having Dayton Day on Sunday. And to honor those two, after they're having a Q&A afterwards and a meet and greet, which is a great way for the Dayton people to come show their support. So exactly. with all that, the reason I'm saying that's because Sunday will probably be my first time to see to see Miami this year as well. I, I've seen Cedarville. I saw Cedarville play Ashland, which is and Ashland's the defending national champions with almost everybody back, I think. And they scored at the buzzer to beat Cedarville by a point in the game I was at. It was a great atmosphere. I saw how Dominican play that night as well. So it was a doubleheader. So I saw how Dominican play that day as well too. But the college scene, like you said, and I've told I told a couple of colleges over the weekend at the Journey to the Tourney, which is a big tip-off high school tournament that was held in Lakota West. A lot of college coaches. I'm like, you realize that, like, if you're an NAIA or JUCO or D2 or three in this area, you never have to leave I-75 to have a great team. You, you start you start down Lakota West, up to, to up to Lima, maybe not that far. Maybe maybe okay you can go to Lima. So for, from from Lima down to Lakota West, you know 100 miles maybe whatever whatever that is mileage wise. That's not um, bad. You have an opportunity, and then you 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 don't you branch off like right off the interstate. All the schools, you can put together some really good small level college basketball teams. You don't have to you don't I mean Dayton, Cincinnati, Wright State, Miami, Ohio State, they're gonna recruit whoever they want nationally. But if you're Edison, Sinclair, Wilmington, Wittenberg, you could stay on this the the, the corridor of seventy five and always have good teams because of the talent we have around here. And when teams around here focus on their local talent and bringing them up the college ranks, that makes it even more special for these right. schools. And you're you you going to have people at the games. You're going to have attendance to be decent, as decent as it could be, I guess, for for women's basketball. Um, but you're right. You're going to have it's it's going it's a win win for everybody. If you, I mean, if you have a kid who's a if you have a good kid, if you have an eight out of ten kid that you're recruiting from Dayton and you and you're Wilmington and then you have a nine out of ten from Columbus I'm taking the Dayton kid even though she she may be a little bit less talented or skilled because this is it's good for the program to and and, and they're still both gonna be great players it doesn't matter that that little difference is gonna make a big difference but my thing is you know if you recruit the Dayton area 
I, I told someone the other day, you know, somebody, you know, somebody mentioned, well, why don't the local coaches recruit more local kids? And at the Division One, at the Division One level, it's, you know, they they probably are trying to get them, but some kids just don't want to stay close to home. Some kids want to get out and experience college, per se, on the road. But other times, it's like sometimes I scratch my head at why some of these schools will not listen to the fact that Dayton area has loaded with talent. You know, it's like they won five games last year. Why did you win? And you're going to win five games again this year because you just, you know, you, you need to start in your backyard. And there's a lot of great players locally that can help these colleges. And But fortunately, a lot of the colleges are are recruiting around here first because it's like, hey, you know, there's so much talent at all age levels. All the way down to like middle school right now, there's just so much talent. So the colleges, you know, they're going to have an opportunity to make their program better. They're going to get more people in there. And it's great for the college to have local kids come there anyway. So I agree. Now let's talk about some of the games collegially you would like to see with your own eyes. Well, obviously, I'd love to see Dayton Wright State play well, on the men's side, especially. But on the women's side, you know, Dayton Wright State, Ohio State. I got to go see Ohio State, the the doubleheader with Ohio State, Louisville, Stanford, and Connecticut. Saw that a couple weeks ago, which was unbelievable basketball. The place was just electrifying. That's what I'd love to see basketball get to at that level. I realize it's not going to have. I know Wright State and Dayton is not going to have 10,000 people for a women's game. I mean, maybe, you know, even against each other, you're going to have a lot less than that. But I would still love to see them play. Um, I, I mean, I want to see them play. Um, love to see um, – I mean, I'm a rivalry guy. I, I like to see Dayton Race State. I like to see Xavier Cincinnati. And I know some of them play each other. But to be at the game personally, the the excitement is just over the top when it comes to having the local – the local rivalries, even even Edison State, Sinclair, even Wittenberg, Wilmington, you know, at some, or you know, Cedarville, and Ohio Dominican, or, or something like that, you know, some, you know, the local rivals are what I like to see, and because like it means too. it means a lot to those schools. I think this year Cincinnati's at Xavier, and the next year when Fifth Third Arena is done being renovated, then the Bearcats host both men's and women's crosstown shootout battles with Xavier. I mean, you see UC and Xavier make a big deal about the men's basketball battle, but the women's basketball is good there too. Absolutely. They both, you know, they both do a great job and, you know, they you know, they do have some talent. Look, and like I said, that would be a game that, you know, who's to say I may not pop into that game. I may I may just slide in and check that game out because it's it's a great rivalry, local rivalry game. I mean, Central State and Cedarville, that's a great rivalry, too, because the schools have such close history together, especially with that Xenia tornado in the 70s. Cedarville absolutely, was one of the first to right. to Central yeah, State yeah. to welcome them in. And, I mean, Central yes. State's no longer in the GMAC anymore, the Great Midwest Athletic Conference. They're in the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. But at the same time, just seeing those two square off, and Central State and Wilberforce, too. Central State was... A bloom off of Wilberforce before the two split in their two separate entities on US 42. I mean, that's a great rivalry. And I was part yes. of one broadcast with CSU and Wilberforce. I mean, that place, Beacom Lewis, was packed. It was great. It was great to hear, great to feel the vibe. And local rivalries are some of the best rivalries you can have out there. I agree. Yeah, I think, I think they should um, and even high school, you know, the, I think that the local rivalries are sometimes the best. The, if, a, if a city has two schools, you know, I think they should play each other because I think it's great for the communities. Absolutely. I, I you know, wholeheartedly agree on that. I mean, rivalries are good. Back when Springfield North played Springfield South, I mean, oh. that was that was a battle of Springfield. Tip City versus Tip City Bethel. That, that would be a local, uh, uh, you know, kind of a rivalry battle between those two. And also you know, Miamisburg, West Carrollton, that's a big rival, the Battle of Old 25. That, that, that's, a, that's a backyard rivalry for sure. I mean, you got your conference rivalries too. I mean, Valley View, Bellbrook, 
the two lie on 725. Well, close enough anyway. Twin Valley right. South, Tri-County North, formerly Twin Valley North. You know, you got two schools, same colors, same team name, the Panthers. The list goes on. There's great rivalries out there, too. And tomorrow, going back to Ansonia, they're battling Bradford, and I think that's off 47, might be 36. But I think Bradford's off 36, right. Okay. I, I, I wasn't wholly sure on that, but still, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a good rivalry right there. Two small schools, yeah. bam. Definitely. I agree. That's, that, that's what it should be all about. Exactly. And I, like I mentioned, wholeheartedly agree on that. And we got a couple minutes before you got to go back to work. So I know how much you love this sport. Let's talk hockey. High school hockey's underway. And the closest team to you would be the Troy Trojans at Hobart Arena. The closest teams to me, I got four of them. Two at the Kettering Ice Arena, the Beaver Creek Beavers and the Alter Knights. Alter moving from South Metro to Kettering this season. And at South Metro, you have the Centerville Elks and the Springboro Panthers, both teams that I broadcast for on YouTube. And both those teams I feel very close to in parts of hockey family. I mean, most of the time, after the game, I don't stay just to tear down. I stay and talk with the parents and everything. It's it's quite a good feeling. It's, it's a great thing. People ask, why are you still doing your basketball 32 years later? It's because, and you know, you have your knuckleheads you deal with every so often, but, yeah. but 95% of the time, it's great. And the parents are great. The coaches are tremendous. The players are very respectful. And, you know, that that's the whole reason they do it. I mean, you know, you, you do it to help them out. And, you know, you deal with great people. Working with great people makes, it's not even work. It's really, it's just fun. You know, and, that, and that's just why I love to do it. And I think that's why I like broadcasting so much for the Elks and the Panthers, because just all the appreciation I receive from them, I'm like, I don't really do much. I just sit right. and I talk right, into right. a microphone. And some people, if they can't make it to the rink, they'll listen to me and they'll watch it. Oh, I really mm-hmm. do. But yeah, I mean, I've been, been a big hockey fan now since about 2008, and, and 10 years actually. And exciting. The, and I, I, I wish more schools locally had it, but I know I know, understand it. They don't. It's a very expensive sport to, to maintain. Very. And plus, and, it's hard to find ice, especially if you if you're around Dark County or Preble County or thing. Your closest rink is a county away, so. Yeah, you you're, you're not going to – Tri-Village is not – or well, unless you go to Richmond if they have something. I don't even know if they do. But like Franklin Monroe is not going to go to Hobart to practice every night. No. And and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's one thing. College hockey, you know, it's – it's Miami's always big time, and Bowling Green is solid as well. But, you know, I'm big like you are into the NHL, and, you know, obviously the Penguins, two-time Stanley Cup champs, they're struggling. They're up and down this year. You know, they've dealt with – they lost a lot of free agencies. They're dealing with the injuries. They just lost Matt Murray, their goalie, after getting rid of Mark Andre Fleury to Vegas. So now they're down to Tristan Jari, who coming in from you know the minors. I call it the minors. Yeah. Um, and, but you know you still got you know Gany Malkin's been out. So it's one of those things where you know hopefully they can right the ship. They're usually a second. They're usually an after Christmas team anyway. So I'm not I'm not jumping off the ship like some people <laughs> might be right now, you gotta, but even you the Blue Jackets, even the Blue Jackets, you know, the Blue Jackets are again playing really well. Right now they're playing well. I knew coming in with the tra- with the with the new faces they have in the lineup this year, and the fact that they were successful last year, I actually had the Blue Jackets winning the uh, Metro this year, because I figured the Penguins have, after having two long Stanley Cup runs. It takes its toll on you, especially when you play 25 or 30 extra hockey games each year for two years. And your and your summer is really short, you know, and then you go to training camp and you got to go at it again. I was, I would, I was not surprised. The Penguins right now are, are battling a little above 500. But I thought Columbus, this was Columbus's year to win the Metro. And they still could. I mean, obviously, there's still plenty of time. Yeah, there's a lot of season to go. So a lot of season to go, and you know Bob's a heck of a goalie, and they do a great job with the new guys that are coming in, me- meshing well with the guys, the veterans. And I look for Columbus. I still, I still think Columbus. 
would will win the Metro. But then you have, you know, you have a whole bunch of mix of different teams that, that are going to battle. You know, and you don't want to be the two and three because you're facing each other in the first round of the playoffs, which is not fair. You know, the Penguins dealt with the last year having to face the Blue Jackets in the first round. It was a physical battle. It was physical for, you know, the whole series. So, you know, obviously I'd love to see the Penguins th- three-peat, but I don't know. I mean, the more I watch them every night, the more I realize – the people they lost were major losses. But, like you, you mentioned, know. still lots of season to be played, and I'm worried about the Blue Jackets. I mean, playoffs for Columbus, history doesn't bode well for the Jackets, and that's still a huge mountain to climb. You take one series at a time. But I'm just worried that the Blue Jackets get too hot like they did last season. What was it, 17 games undefeated? 17 in a row. Just, and everybody was giving them a Stanley Cup, and it's like, you guys need to realize. They're still season's playoffs. far from over with. Exactly. I mean, I you just know. hope the Blue Jackets don't get too hot. But on the flip side, I'm very happy to see that the Winnipeg Jets are much improved, and they're having a great start to the season as well. I mean, former and so jacket. is Vegas. How about Vegas? How about Vegas? First year they as are, a team. They're, they're just they're playing extremely well. Absolutely, that's that's fun to see. And former Blue Jackets coach uh, Galliard is leading the pack, and that's good to see as well. Him still in the coaching ranks. Yes. But locally, we only have one team in the NCAA's. That's the Miami Redhawks at Guggen Ice Arena. Mm-hmm. But a lot of colleges around here have their own club teams. They're not affiliated with their athletic departments, but they still play. There's no scholarships to be had for playing hockey. I mean, you can get academic scholarships to Wright State and help pay off. But there's a lot of local hockey teams. Wright State's got a team. They're now at the Chiller in Springfield. Dayton's at Kettering. Cincinnati and Xavier, I think they share Sports Plus. Okay, that makes sense. Miami... Along with the varsity team, they have a club hockey team as well. And there's a lot of great hockey to see around here as well. With your passion for basketball, I mean, there's there's great hockey all about here as well. We're lucky to be in the Sunday area because there's a lot of great sports to be had right no here. No doubt about it. No, no doubt about it. Jim, I will... Let you go back to work. Thank you for your time on episode 15 on the gem on the Queen's Crown. And that will be you next time. And we'll get together again, talk basketball, and talk hoops here on the podcast. My pleasure. Anytime you need me, you know how to read. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you. That's Thank you very Jim much, Lee, and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Jim. That's Jim DeBelt. You can follow him on Twitter at jdabs 86 J D A double B S eight six and also visit his website at jimdebelt.com. Just a couple things before we close out the episode. Again, thank you, Jim, for coming on the podcast with me to talk basketball and hockey. Just to update on if I have actually called anyone breaking the thousand point mark in high school basketball in Ohio. I looked at my Twitter archive and I know I wished a couple of Twin Valley South Panthers, namely Michael Green and Wes Cole, for TVS. I wish them congrats on breaking the record, but I did not broadcast those games. And I want to say there was a Brookville Blue Devil that broke a 1,000 points at a game. And no, I did not. Marcus Briscoe, formerly of the Brookville Blue Devils, that broke a 1,000, and I was not at that game. You know, thinking back on it, it was Valley View and Twin Valley South at Valley View. And I want to say there was a thousand point score in that game for the view, but I don't remember who it was. So I do apologize about that. Just an update in case you really were questioning if I called any of those games or not. I checked after the interview and I did not. So here's what episode 16 is going to hold. It's going to be recorded On Monday, the first Monday of December 2017, last month of the year. Whew, this time flies by, especially considering I started this podcast in July, and we're heading into the 16th episode. 
very special episode for you. We'll be back with Mark Schlemmer, but it's not going to be just Mark and I talking sports for about two hours. We are going to do something called a round table. And the reason why it's called a round table is because the table is round. No, we're going to have several sports fans come on the podcast and we are going to talk Cincinnati Dayton sports. And I am looking forward to seeing what episode 16 can do. And before we bid out this episode, just to let you know that I do have a lot of ideas planned for episode 17, 18, 19, 20. 20th possibly being the last day of 2017 or the first day of January 2018. I haven't quite decided that, but I do have ideas floating around. They won't be confirmed on this podcast because I have to make sure I iron all the details out. That would be important before I say something will happen. So, to follow me on Twitter, it's the Lee W. Mowen. T H E L E E W M O W E N. All about spelling usernames on Twitter for some reason this episode. Maybe that'll go away next week. Also, like the Facebook page, the Gem on the Queen's Crown, for behind the scenes look on this podcast. And you can also listen to this podcast on the following platforms GemCitySports.com, the Lee W. Mowen.com, as well as Google Play iTunes, and possibly your favorite iTunes podcast app, along with Stitcher, TuneIn, Pocket Casts, and now iHeartRadio. And don't forget, there's an option to subscribe to the podcast via email. Just go to theleewmowen.com, same as the Twitter username, and click Podcast, and you can register for the updates via email. And that will finally do it for episode 15. On to episode 16 of The Gem on the Queen's Crown. I bid you a fond farewell. Hope your Thanksgiving was good. If you're listening to this out of the United States and you don't celebrate Thanksgiving late November, I hope your days were good. Until the 16th episode, this is Lee W. Mowen signing off. Thanks for listening to The Gem on the Queen's Crown. Don't forget to like the Facebook page, The Gem on the Queen's Crown. Follow the podcaster, The Lee W. Mowen, on Twitter and Instagram. Also, visit www.theleewmowen.com and www.gemcitysports.com.